Good morning and welcome to the second session of uh, week three of uh, the late start in uh, physical science, basically physics 101. So today we are continuing with our topic that we started on uh, Monday, namely the uh, we're doing optics really. And in optics, we study how light basically interact, or at least how light is, uh, is uh, moves around in a sense that it bounces off uh, media and or actually refracts of some others. This leads to an interesting uh, uh, thing, which is uh, how images form when they do that. Because basically, when you look at an object in their, your surroundings, so what you're looking at is the light reflected from all kinds of sources. So if the uh, light is coming from the sun and hits, for example, a building. So what you're looking at is how is that light is bouncing off of that building. And what it does, it does what is known as a diffuse reflection. So once the light comes in, and it all comes in parallel from the sun, but when once it hits the building, it goes in every which way uh, directions. And uh, of course, depending on the object that you're looking at, uh, uh, objects have different colors. Sometimes they appear basically uh, kind of uh, light colors, but sometimes they appear specific colors, green, red, whatever color that you're looking at. And those, because again, they reflect specific colors. In the lab we did on Monday, if you guys remember, we had a white source of light. And then we, what we did, we took those things called diffraction grading, which is made up of, uh, uh, which is made up of those fine lines, basically that basically breaks that that uh, that uh, that uh, glass. So you have some extremely fine lines, and the one that we use has five hundred lines per uh, millimeter, meaning the spacing between each different lines is two micrometers or two times 10 to the negative six meters. So what happened then when you look at the light, which is white light, which appears to us to be white light, it's broken down to an entire spectrum, continuous spectrum of all kinds of light from the extreme uh, uh, dark red to the extreme dark violet, basically, and anywhere in between them. So this is basically the spectrum that we see. That is what we mean by light. It's, a, it's either a single frequency or the combination of those frequencies. When it's unique color, when it's a unique one, like for example, what we did when we put those, those gases, for example, when we put the hydrogen, we saw only four lines. We didn't see the entire spectrum. So what's going on in there is you have a gas that has been put under tremendous voltage, the power source. Remember, we had to plug it and turn it on. So a tremendous voltage. So the gas that gets excited so its atoms basically move from where they were at rest, where the gas did not was not uh, showing any colors whatsoever, was not uh, emitting any light whatsoever, to a point that it's so excited that its electrons move from the ground state, from where they're supposed to be sitting, to a higher energy level. So they get excited. Because of what? Because of the voltage. The voltage is the, the one that causes them to get excited. Once they're excited, they don't want to stay in that uh, basically excited state. So they want to go back to where they were, to the ground state. In doing, in doing so, when they move from the excited state to the ground state, they emit that light. And they emit only specific frequencies that are only due to those energy transitions. And that's what we were looking at. For the case of hydrogen, we saw in the visible range only four colors. Okay. For the case of helium, we saw more uh, lines. But those are the only lines that are that are visible. Each and every one of those lines is a unique frequency. And that is actually a monochromatic light, meaning it's a light of a single color. Mono is a single, chromatic is color, monochromatic light. White light is not monochromatic. Light light, white light is a combination of all the, the colors that we see. And that's what we proved actually in the lab. When we looked at the source for the light bulb that was completely white, and we ran it through the diffraction grading, we saw it breaking into a continuous spectrum of all the colors that we see in the rainbow. So it's not really a monochromatic, but when we took a gas like helium, neon, and also uh, hydrogen, and also we took the unknown, uh, the unknown gas, no, I'm sorry, we didn't do the unknown gas, we did for the astronomy class. But the, the point in here, we did three gases, and each and every one of them was showing a single line. 
okay, or like a combination of the different lines. And again, the reason why I have many of these lines for a specific element is because when the electron was sitting in the ground state, it gets excited either to this ground, to this uh, excited state or to, to the next one or to the higher one. If it jumps from the highest one to the ground state, that is gonna give you a very high frequency closer to the violet range. If it jumps only the small amount of energy, then it's going to give you a low energy uh, emission, which would correspond to the red side of the spectrum. So this is basically in a nutshell what was going on in our, in our uh, experiment. Okay, and this is the story of light. So light, when we looked at it, at least in the early, the early humans, basically when they were analyzing it, the first ones, at least they hypothesized it's made up of tiny particles. Why so? Because when it bounces off of surface, a reflective surface like the mirror, it bounces off so that there is, it appears as if you take a tennis ball, for example, and you hit it on the wall, the, the tennis ball, if you hit it straight up, is going to bounce back to you. But if you hit it at an angle, it's going to, uh, to make, a, it's going to come out an angle in such a way that the angle of incidence with which the tennis ball will come in or with which the, the light will come in is equal to the angle of reflection, whether it's a tennis ball or a light. So light must, have, must be made up of tiny particles. That's basically the assumption because it behaves just like what you do with a tennis ball. Okay, the other interesting law also that we saw was that when light crosses between two media of different densities, light bends. So if it's coming this way, it's going to bend if it is going to a thicker medium with a higher index of refraction. So what is the index of refraction again? This is just a reminder. It's the ratio of how fast light moves in a medium versus how much it would have moved in vacuum or air. Air and vacuum, for all practical purposes, air also. In air, light travels with the same speed, which is the speed of light. And we discussed how the speed of light was measured, and it turns out to be about 300,000 kilometers per second. Okay, so this is in a nutshell basically what we know up to this point. Then we took interesting devices. The first one that we looked at was the mirror. So let me share with you a screen to, to see what we did. And that is a flat mirror. So when we looked at the flat mirror, we saw that an image will form on the other side, okay? And that image will obey the law of, uh, of uh, Reflection in this case, because the mirror is coated from one side in such a way light does not go through it. Okay, so light, if it hits the, the, the surface of the mirror, is going to bounce back. And when it does, the angle of incidence must be equal to the angle of reflection. So that is basically one of the laws that we discovered as far as optics. Is. Now, this object that is sitting in here. There is a light source somewhere, either the light bulb that you have, you have in your room or it's the, uh, the sun or something. There are all kinds of light sources in here. Some light is reflected of some other media and become sources of their own. So now there is a light source. So as light hits this object, it's going to bounce in all directions. So it's going to reflect in every which way. Why? Because the surface of regular materials, like you and I, when we stand in front of the mirror, is not really a smooth, shiny thing. It's usually there is all kinds of things in it. So that's why the surface, the light moves in every direction, in which way, every which way you look at that object, you will see it, okay? As long as the light is shining behind you. If the light is shining on the object and you are behind, behind the object, you're gonna see a dark see a region of the, uh, the object. And that is because you don't see the object. So that's typical. Okay, so that's what we know. Anyway, the point being in here is that there is light coming now from the object because of this diffuse reflection, and it goes in all directions. One of these rays will go straight to the mirror and bounce back on the mirror again because the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection, since the angle of incidence is zero degrees. Remember, the, the angle of incidence is respected to the normal. To the perpendicular direction to the to the mirror so if you come straight perpendicular to it there is no angle so the angle as it bounces back is also zero so it bounces back straight up straight back up so this is a ray that bounces back so if you're looking at the mirror you're standing and you look at your eye straight up that is the ray we're talking about 
But if you look at your hand or you look at, for example, or your feet, then you're going to see something else in here, which is the reflection of this is the foot where it's standing. So you're going to see and see the, your foot in here. Okay. So this is the rays and they all obey the law of reflection, which is the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. For me, when I construct the image, looking at, for example, that same object from this angle, what I'm looking at is this reflected ray. So there is an incident from the object. Remember the objects in, in all directions. So for me, I'm seeing the reflected image, the reflected uh, ray, and the reflected ray has an angle of reflection equal to the angle of incidence. But because we are trained in the eye, and this surface is fine, uh, is, is reflective anyway, so we think that the image is coming from behind the screen. Okay, and we project an image and actually we visually see it that there is an object on the other side, or at least a replica of the object on the other side, we call it an image. In this situation, the image is not real. The reason why it's not real is because if I take an, if I go behind and look, there is nothing in there. And case in point, if I take a film, in the old days we have 35 millimeter films to make to make pictures, to make to draw to, to make images. If you put a film in there and expose it, it's not going to develop anything. It's going to just be exposed, especially if there is a light source in here, it's going to all come out white. There is nothing in it. Okay. The negative always comes white if there is nothing in it. And if there is an object, it's the, the imprint of the object would be actually a, a dark color. Okay. So the point being in here, you're not going to form an image in here. So the image is actually virtual. It's not a real image. It would have been real if somehow you could place your, your film in here and it's going to develop. So this is in a sense why it's virtual. So the word virtual means actually it's not real. That's exactly what it means, okay, as opposed to a real image, okay? And the image is going to be on the other side at the same distance. This is one of the problems that they assigned for you guys to show that indeed this distance from here, from the image to the mirror is the same distance as from the object to the mirror. It has to be identical. Okay, so this is something that we have to show. It's part of a homework assignment that you guys can work out. And actually we're going to, uh, to discuss it today in the uh, problem solving section of today. So uh, uh, stick around because we're going to go through all of the problems that I assigned to make sure that you guys have uh, an understanding on how to do them. So this is how the image is formed. So the image is gonna be exactly on the opposite side at the same distance, okay? And it's magnification. It's going to be one because the size of the object and the size of the object and the size of the image will be the same. So the ratio would be one to one. So it's not going to be magnified. And like what we do, for example, when we use a microscope, the purpose of the microscope is to take, for example, a tiny virus or I don't know if you can do a virus, tiny, for example, a, 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 a microbe, whatever that is, and then you blow it up and you can see it, okay? cells, for example. Okay, you can see uh, cells that you cannot see with your naked eye, but then with a the microscope, you, you, you will have a magnification, which is much higher than, uh, than, uh, than, uh, than that value. For that, we use different devices. So the flat mirror will not work for that, okay? You will need to have something else. <clears throat> anyway, so this is the flat mirror, the first object that we looked, uh, we looked at. This is a diffusion. They also, uh, the, we looked at the concave mirror. The concave mirror also is interesting in a sense that you can make an image. I think I also assign problem for the concave mirror. Usually the typical problems that you would be assigned are the concave mirror because it's easier actually to make images with it than the convex mirror. So this is a converging mirror and also a, a flat mirror, the one that I, uh, I already discussed and also converging lenses. It's easier to make images with those as opposed to diverging lenses. And we're gonna talk about the other principle. So this is basically um, how to form an image. To make an image, you really need three, three, three lines, okay? Typically the three lines are, uh, the line that comes from infinity and hits the, the tip of the object. So this is your object. That line will cross the mirror and bounces back and always passes through the focal point. So now you have one line. The other line 
is the one that comes straight because typically you put the object in the uh, on the uh, on the axis of symmetry. So that line that goes through the axis of symmetry must bound back on the axis of symmetry because it comes at ninety degree angle. I'm sorry, zero degree angle. Ninety degree with respect to the tangent, but again, it's going to be the zero degree angle of incidence, so it's a zero degree angle of reflection. So this is the same line basically. So now you have two lines, and two lines will not make, give you an object because uh, an image because the image could be anywhere in here. So what you need, you need the third line. Typically in this situation, you take a line that comes from infinity, graze the tip of the object, hit the mirror on the axis of symmetry in this point, and then bounce back. And it bounces back again with the angle of incidence equals to the angle of reflection. That's true all the time on the mirror, anywhere on the mirror. Okay, for this case, it's a concave mirror. It's still true, whether it's a flat mirror, concave, or even convex. Uh, yeah, so it's true for all of that. So in this case, now where these two lines meet, where this line, the first one that grazes the tip of the uh, of the uh, uh, object, and then stays parallel to the axis of the uh, of the mirror, and bounces off of the uh, of the focal point, that is one line, the reflected one, and the second one that grazes again the the tip of the object and hit it right in the middle of the axis of symmetry and then bounces back, it's going to bounce back, not necessarily on the focal point, it's going to bounce back anywhere. So as it does, the only condition here is the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection and that is going to bounce back, okay? When it does, the two lines meet and that gives you where the tip of the object is. And we're gonna do that too. That's part of an assignment anyway. So we're gonna do it also. And I'm going to ask you guys to do it. And I know you did it actually in the lab too, uh, toward the end where you guys made the, uh, made the uh, found the, uh, because you did it first of all, experimentally trying to find the, uh, the image, okay? by moving the mirror back and forth, no, by moving, not the mirror, by moving the, the screen back and forth, because you have three things. You have the object, you have the lens, and we were losing, using a lens actually, and then the object was nailed fixed, and the lens, uh, the lens was also asked, you were asked to fix it at certain distances. And now the only thing, the only option you have really is the, uh, is the, uh, is the, uh, the screen. Where do you place the screen? And you were making decisions, and it's a critical to understand this, this concept. Uh, you were trying to make decisions to see how uh, uh, the sharpest image that you can make. And that was really a personal call. And that's why some of you got in errors in the, in the, between the experimental and the, uh, when you did the construction. Because when you did the construction, you found a value, but the experimental was off a little bit. Let me explain this last point because it's a very, very important point to understand. In order to produce the sharpest image possible, and if your construction is perfect, you want any light, remember it's a diffuse object, a diffuse uh, reflection from the object, any light that grazes the tip of the object and it goes at an angle, it doesn't matter which angle, as long as it hits a mirror, it has to pass by again the same tip of the image. And if it does that, that is actually the actual place for the image. Now, if it misses it slightly off, on and off, then you have combination of lights that is not as intense as it should be if all of them converge in the same point. So the condition for focus really is that you would want to have all the lights combining to give you the image and the image will be sharp. This is why when you take a picture with your camera, and you stand in front of the object, and if the lens is way zoomed out, zoomed out or the lens way zoomed in, the image is not sharp. So what you do in here with a focuser on your on your on your uh, on your camera, you bring the you move the uh, the the the, uh, the lens in and out, okay, until you find the sharpest or what you judge is the sharpest image. Then you're gonna click the button, and then you have an image as sharp as you can get. Sometimes with cameras that don't have zoom uh, uh, lenses, what you do, you find yourself moving either closer or further away from the object, okay? Trying to do the same thing, trying to come up with the sharpest image that you can have, okay? And again, that is more of an art than really a, a science, but in science, 
And I know some of you are later on moving on to uh, to uh, the calc based courses. You're going to be taking two, 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 three, two, four, and all of the other classes. When you do take those, you will learn something in calculus known as uh, as a Taylor series. So what you do in this case, you're actually going to do calculations and use Taylor series to find the how to make a focus. And you will know then that it is impossible, at least theoretically to focus all the lights, no matter how great your mirror is, no matter how well constructed your mirror is. So the only thing you can do is basically try to say, okay, this is the best I can do with my image. For the group where Aliyah was, what we did actually, we did find the image three ways. Experimentally, they found 32 centimeters. I remember those because I was with them. And they, they measured it. And they all decided that this is the sharpest point where we can find the image by moving the screen back and forth. They found that the distance between the lens and the and the uh, and the uh, screen was 32 centimeters, and they documented that. I don't, I don't. Uh, I'm not saying that they're wrong. Actually, they are. This is a perfect experiment. It was done great. I mean, they are going to receive full mark. There is no question about it. Then when they did the construction, and I was with them, they found the actual construction, geometrical construction, to be 33.4 centimeters. So they were off by 1.4 centimeters according to the construction, geometrical construction, by taking exactly what I was describing in here and finding the rays where they meet and everything. So they found 33.4 centimeters. So they were off according to this one by 1.4 centimeters. There was a third way of doing it too, using the 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 uh, the law of how the image is formed, and I and I also I put it actually post it on the screen, uh, post it on the blackboard in there, the whiteboard I said. So one over the object position, plus one over the image position, is equal to one over the focal length of the lens or the mirror. So this is true all the time. Since we know where the object is located, so this is known. Since you guys measured also the focal length of all your, your lenses, you took them, you put them on next to the, the whiteboard, whiteboard, and you were looking at an object outside of the window and trying to find the sharpest image possible. That's what the focal point is. The focal point in here for a mirror like this one is the point where all the rays coming from infinity from very far away, they all has to pass through it. That's what the focus means, the focal point. Okay, so this point in here, you took it and you stood in front of the screen, in front of the whiteboard, and you took your lens and you moved it into the whiteboard or away from it until you found, found the sharpest image that forms from the trees far away on the other side of the lab. Okay. So now you have the focal point, you have the focal distance. So you have the focal length of that lens. You know where you placed your object, which is just behind the, 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 uh, the uh, lens, okay? You know that distance, you already controlled it. So using this equation, we can find where the image is. All you have to do is mo move the, uh, the object to the other side, and you subtract one over the focal length minus one over the object and once you find the difference between them you invert it and now you have where the object is so in that group and i'm sharing the results in here because i think it can benefit everybody so that group experimentally they found the image forming at 32 centimeters i should say 32 centimeters so they placed their object the the object in here they place the lens in here, and the image formed somewhere in here. Okay, and that is 32 centimeters according to their measurements. Okay, because again they were moving the screen in and out, trying to find the sharpest image, and this is what they uh, did. So when they did the geometry, what they found actually this is not true. They found 33.4 centimeters. They actually used the ruler and found the parallel and drew the same shape as I was describing, except it's for lenses, okay? 
And then we did the calculation, the same thing that we did in here, the one I was describing in here. And with the calculation, they found the image to be formed at 33.3 centimeters. So these two are more or less theoretical. One by construction, the first one, and the other one by calculation. And this one is by experiment. Which one is wrong? None of them is wrong. All of them are actually acceptable. All of these numbers are good. I mean, if somebody is picky and trying to say, okay, how much error in your judgment for the sharpness of the image? Well, in that case, the error is 33.4 uh, or 33.3, doesn't matter which one, deduct from it this one, which is 1.3 divided by 32. But remember, when they measured the focal length, when you guys measure the focal length and you find it to be 12 centimeters or 10 centimeters, or depending on your lens, or 50, for a 15 centimeter than one group did, uh, it has an error too, because you were sharpening and <laughs> you were trying to find the sharp image of the far away object. First of all, the object is not that far, really. It's only probably about uh, uh, 60 meters away from us or something. So it's not really at infinity, OK? So if somebody wants to be picky about that, that's really not that far. But 60 centimeters compared to the size of the the centimeter, the, uh, the, the focal length is, is really 60 meters, I'm sorry, is, is relatively uh, infinity. OK, so that's not really a big deal. But how sharp is the image? And you guys did the three measurements. And each time, probably you have, and not probably all of you have different answers. And he found the average, and he decided this is the focal length. So there was an error already in the focal length. There was also an error in the readings of these numbers, too for where the object is from the lens, and then from where the image is from where the lens is. So there are some built-in errors, and that builds up and came up with this number. So this is natural. So in even these calculations, they have in them that, that inherent error for the focal length and also for where the object is. So even those that were saying that they are theoretical, whether, I'm sorry, whether the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, this one or this one too, they have that, that inherent errors in them. So, to say that the calculation is more accurate than the experiment is wrong, because even the calculation is based on an experiment. So I just wanted to make sure that you guys, you have this full understanding of the process and went on, went on in the experiment so that you also have an understanding of what's going on in terms of the, uh, in terms of the, uh, this, this thing, so that you have, you're in full confidence for that. I know, that you were not required in the lab to do the calculation. The only two things that you were required to do in the lab were the experiment and actually the geometry construction at the end. So that is what is uh, uh, required. But the calculation is not that hard, really. This is from here to here. That is the object direction, uh, the object uh, position. From here to here is where the image is supposed to be. And the lens itself is has its own focal length. Okay. And that's the formula that I've been mentioning again. It's worth remembering. This is one of the things that is probably useful to remember. One over the distance to the object, which is this distance, one over the image is equal to one over the focal length. Okay. Now this formula works for mirrors. I did not really talk a lot about the uh, diverging uh, mirror like this one. Because one thing in here is the, the, uh, the, the construction is a little bit hard. It's not that hard. It's a little bit more hard to do. So this is a, this is a diverging uh, mirror or a con convex mirror. Uh, it's really because here is the thing. Here is the object, OK? Here is the axis of symmetry. The light, when it comes from infinity, it's going to bounce back, and it's going to bounce back at this, at this direction, as if it's coming from this is the focal length. This distance is the focal length, OK? As it's coming from there. In addition to this light, now, this light that is going to hit the, uh, the mirror in here is going to bounce off of it in here, OK? Now, if I extend this, this light as if it's coming. So this is the real light, OK? So this is a real incoming ray. And this is a real outgoing ray. As if it's coming from behind the mirror. The same thing. This is an incoming ray. 
and this is the outgoing ray. As if it's coming from here, as if it's going like this, and this one as if it's coming like this one. And the same thing, this one is coming in here, and it's going to bounce back in the same direction, whichever way it came. So those are the actual lights. But the image is forming behind. This is where the image is. This is its foot. This is its tip. The tip, again, is because there are a com combination of where it's coming, as if it's coming from the hands. So the first thing you notice is that this image is virtual, and it's not real. OK? And like this image, which is a real image, where is the this real uh, this image in here that is forming? It's actually a real image. I could because these are real rays bouncing back for the case of the concave mirror. So in that case, I can put an object in there. I mean, I can put a, uh, a film in there, and it's going to develop. It's going to give me uh, something. But here, there is nothing on the other side. There is no light going through the other side. The light, all of it, is happening only on this side. So. This is basically how I do it by construction. So I can find the image, and it's a virtual image, and it's an upright image actually in this situation. And like this one, which is upside down, which is um, inverted. So this is an inverted image if the object is at far away from the uh, focal length. But if the object is actually sitting near the focal length, the image actually is going to also, I'm sorry, the image is going to be virtual and uh, the, is going to be upright, OK? So that, and you can do that actually this way too, when you can find where the image is. All the time it's gonna be virtual in this situation. That's the only distinction, okay? Now, one thing that you need to know in here is that the focal length here is negative. So if you want to uh, work off of this, you have to know that, that when you use that, uh, uh, that relationship that I was talking about, it's still true in here too. This one over the focal length. This number is negative. That's it, negative, not negative one, it's negative. So negative whatever that is, okay? So if, it's in, if the distance is 10 centimeters, it's gonna be negative 10 centimeters. So when you do, you have to have one over negative 10, okay? That's the only difference in here. So if you're going to use the math, you have to remember that for a diverging mirror, this number is negative, okay? For converging mirror, the focal length is positive. So that is one big distinction, okay? Optics is a little bit, sometimes you have to pay attention to this detail. By the way, the object is always positive. So always place the object at a positive location. The image can be positive or negative. In this situation, if it's negative and it's gonna be negative all the time, then uh, uh, the image is always going to be virtual. You ask me, why is that? It's easy. Why the image is going to be negative. So I have the image. If I move the object term in the other side, I will have one over the image is equal to one over the focal length. And the focal length, one over the focal length, this is a negative number already. Why you are saying it's because the focal length is negative. So if I invert a negative number, I'm going to get a negative number. And I'm going to subtract from it the position of the object. Since the position of the object is always positive, so, and I have to subtract a positive number. So the end answer is gonna be negative. So the image in this situation is always going to be negative. So the image for a, 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 a convex mirror, is always negative. Whereas the image for a concave mirror can be positive or can be negative depending on where the object sits, okay? Depending on where the object sits. It's, if it's far away from the, uh, from the focal length, then the image is going to be positive. The image is going to be real. If the object sits between the focal length and the uh, and the uh, and the image and the uh, mirror itself, I'm sorry. Then in this case, the image is going to be negative. It's going to be on the other side, virtual, not real. If the object sits right on the focal length, then in this case, the image there is no image. The image is an affinity. It's not in here at all. So hopefully, I covered these two types of mirrors in addition to the flat mirror enough so that you guys have an understanding of what's going on in here in terms of optics. Okay, chapter 18 really deals with the law of refraction and for that we have lenses. Okay, so what's going on with lenses? Again, we have two types of lenses. Typically, we have a converging lens 
symmetrical converging lens. In other words, a converging lens has a focal length in here. And because it's symmetri symmetrical, it has the same focal length in here. So this is the focal length. And this is the focal, actually focal point, I should say. This distance is the focal length. And this distance is also the focal length. If it's symmetrical, it is uh, uh, the same distance. So in other words, a, 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 a lens could be not symmetrical. But what you guys noticed for all the, for the, the lenses that were given to you, they were all symmetrical. If you flip it one way or the other, it works the same way. So in this case, this is a converging lens. That's what we did in lab. As opposed to a diverging lens, Okay, and that too could have a, a focal length in here, a focal length in here. If it's symmetrical, it will have the same focal length in here, except that the focal length in here is negative also. This is a diverging lens. Okay, the focal length in here is positive. This is a little bit also hard to do just as much as the, uh, the first one, the, uh, the diverging uh, mirrors have. We will have problem also with the, with the construction of diverging lenses because we'll have to have virtual images also. The relationship that governs this one is the same one. The relationship that governs them is then one over the, where the object is plus one over where the image is is equal to one over uh, where the... Uh, Focal length. That is true all the time, except as I was saying in here, it's negative, but in here it's positive. And it's easier actually to deal with this one than to deal with the, uh, with the negative one. That's why the book doesn't really go into a lot of details on this one in here. It shows you a, a diagram on how to make the image again in a similar fashion, but we're not going to focus on it because it's going to throw us a little bit off and it's going to have complications that are not needed. So we're going to focus on the converging links. That's what we did in the lab. That's what we did actually work with in the lab. So we're going to focus on that. Okay. Uh, one useful uh, relationship to remember is that the magnification, you might be asked about it in some of the problems, is equal to the negative of the size of the image over the size of the object. This is size. And this is size or negative. The position is the same thing over the position of this one. So it's either the position or the position. I mean, you can show, if you define it this way, that it leads to that way. It's the same thing. So if I know where the object is, and if I know where the image is, I can actually take the ratio of this negative number over that negative number, and it's going to be a magnification. OK, the reason why you put usually a negative in here, if the answer is positive, that means the image is real. Sorry, if the ratio is negative, the image is real. If the ratio is positive, that means the image is virtual, OK? That's all. That's the, the negative sign. So you could just forget about the negative sign and just take the absolute value and tell me how big the image is compared to how big the object is, OK? So don't bother too much with the negative sign in here. If you see it, just basically find the ratio of how big the object is versus how big the image is. And again, if you look at the flat mirror, the magnification is 1. That is basically the motivation behind it. So for the flat mirror, you have an object sitting in here. This distance and this distance are the same, with the exception that this distance, let's say, for example, is 10 centimeters. This is going to be negative 10 centimeters because it's on the other side of the mirror. So if I do the ratio, it's going to be a negative. The image, which is 10 centimeters with a negative sign on it, divided by 10 centimeters where the object is. So the negative and the negative cancel, and it's going to be positive. 10 centimeters over 10 centimeters is 1. So the magnification of flat mirror is one. That's what the motivation, motivation for that negative sign, so that you don't have to carry it for the flat mirror. But then for a converging lens, for a converging, I'm sorry, uh, mirror, that ratio is going to be negative. 
what it says in this case is the image is upright uh, instead of being uh, so you will have this is the object this is the image and the ratio of this distance over the ratio of this distance or the ratio of this size over the ratio of that size is going to be negative indicating that the object is actually flipped compared to the image the image is upside down compared to the object okay so that's all there is to it in this situation okay if the object sits between the focal points and the uh, and the center of the and the uh, and the mirror then the image is going to be on the other side it's going to be negative and if it's negative over positive is going to be a uh, negative number but don't forget you have a minus so minus times minus is going to be positive so the ratio is going to be positive so that means the image is upright the image and the objects are in the same direction so in the ratio is positive it's just telling me how is it doing compared to the object in other words when you stand on your feet in front of the mirror the image also is standing on its feet it's not upside down that's basically what that positive number means okay but in the case of a, a focusing uh, and in the case of a uh, uh, converging mirror again concave mirror if the object is sitting far away from the focal length the image is upside down. And this is true also for lenses too. <laughs> for lenses too. So if I have a lens in here, and if I want to find the image of an object, let's say, for example, this is my object, okay? It's on this side, on the left-hand side. So what I do in this case is, let's see if I can draw with different colors in here too. Let's see if I have the green. The green looks, I think, okay. Where is the green here? Okay, here it is. So I'm going to draw. This is coming from infinity. This is the ray coming from infinity. It's going to bend inside according to the law of refraction because this is made up of a higher index of refraction. So the light slows down. And as it bends, as it emerges from the other side, it's going to pass by the focal point. Let's say this is the focal point, okay? So this is going to pass by the focal point. So this is one ray. It tells me that the tip of this image is going to be on this line, somewhere in this line, or the extended version of it. Trying to find one. Or the extended version of it. So that's basically what it is. Okay. This is a real ray. The solid line is a real ray. That is one thing. So that doesn't tell me much about, the, about where the image is. The other place that I could do in here is let me pick up a different color. Let me pick up another ray that passes through the center and the tip. So that is a ray that again is going to pass straight through. And that is basically where the image is going to form. So this is where the image is going to form. Remember, the foot of the object and the foot of the image are going to be on the axis of symmetry because we put the object on the axis of symmetry and its foot. Okay. So in this situation, we were able to find where the image is by construction. So you need at least three lines. You need where the foot is, that's one, number one. You need where at least this one that comes from infinity and basically grazes the lens and come through the focal point. So that is line number two. And the third one that you will need is a line that goes through the center of the lens. It doesn't have to pass through the focal point. As a matter, it shouldn't, okay? And you just extend it from the tip of the object through the center of the lens, and that is three, uh, uh, th three, three. So you have three rays. Now you can find where the object is. Okay. Now you can find truly where the object is. I mean, where the image is. I'm sorry. So now you have found where the image is. This is what we did in the lab, by the way. This is how we found the image by construction. Okay. Now since you have the image, this is its length, its position. Let me pick up the different the color that I was using earlier. Since uh, this is the position of the image, this is the position of the object. I would say in this case that one over the object plus one over the image is equal to one over the focal length of that lens. You're worried about what's happened to the thickness in here. Well, the thickness is negligible compared to the uh, 
to these distances, okay? Uh, this, that distance is tiny. As a matter of fact, we don't care about the entire thing. We care only about half the distance in here, okay? So for the axis of symmetry. So if you are really in the business of making lenses, you have to worry about that a little bit, okay? So that is one thing that is actually of interest to us in here, and we try to find where the image is. We can use this formula also to find where the image is sitting. That's similar, in a similar fashion. So this is how we make the image in this situation, okay? Uh, also, the magnification, if you're interested, is still minus one uh, minus uh, position of the image, which is going to be positive in the situation, okay? Because it's on this side, one over the object. And that is by definition for the lens, okay? The, the image is going to be real because you can take actually a film and put it on the other side. And that's how cameras work, as a matter of fact. They have lenses in them. That's how you make films. Okay, whether hitting the CCD, the back, <clears throat> the electronic, uh, basically sensitive device in the back and there that imprints and makes an image for you and saves it as a, as a, as a, as a uh, electronic basically signal. And later on, if you want to send it to the print shop, you can have it printed or actually a film behind the thing. That is how the image forms. And it's a real image because you put a film in there or you put a CCD on the modern cameras or your phone, and it's going to produce an image on the other side of the lens. Okay. Usually for cameras, this distance is fixed. Okay? Or at least you know where the image is going to form because there is a fixed film in there. It's not going to change the location. Uh, what you do in this case, you change the position actually. So this position is not fixed because if you have a zoom camera, the lens moves in and out, okay? And if it's uh, your cell phone, Usually it's an electronic zoom, okay? It's not a real zoom, so it's electronics trying to make adjustments in here to compensate for the uh, for the position of the image versus the lens, okay? So, uh, and if it's not, if it's fixed in a way and you cannot get focus, you have to move back in and out, okay? Bring your phone very close to an object and you're going to lose focus completely. So you have to really uh, bring it up a little bit, okay, <laughs> to make it uh, work, even if it has a very good uh, uh, zooming capabilities in terms of electronics. So that is basically the, the, the difference in this case. So now that is the number is going to be negative in this situation, because this number is positive. This number is positive, and the ratio is going to be negative. So that means the, Im the image is inverted. When the magnification, of course, the size also matters in here and the ratios and all of that matter. So, uh, uh, so this is basically the, uh, 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 this is how we find it, it's uh, inverted, okay? Now, I mentioned that last time and I know I did, if you bring the object actually, if this is the focal length and you bring the object closer, to this one, the image actually, these two lines will never meet. Line two and three will never meet. Uh, at least in front of the lens, they will meet behind it. So in that case, the image is actually virtual and not real. And magnification will be positive in that situation because the image is sitting on the same side of the, um, of the object and the image is going to be a negative number times a negative, it's gonna be positive over whatever that is gonna be as positive. So at the end of the day, uh, the magnification is going to be positive, meaning that the uh, the image first of all is going to be upright in that situation, and it's pointing in the same direction as the object is, and it's going to be virtual, okay? Because it's it seems to be as if from this ray that is coming from far away, and there is no such a thing. It's just an extension of the outgoing ray. So if you put a film in there, it's not going to develop because that's where the cameras are. You have to put the film in here to find the image, okay? So uh, that is basically how uh, lenses work, okay? So we talked about these things in here, and I am, again, in purpose, I'm not trying to spend much time because it's a little bit confusing with the diverging lenses, but this is basically how these things work. Anyway, uh, I mentioned a few times the cameras, and cameras, what they do, actually, they use this principle. And I think in the book, there is a there is a construction for the pinhole camera. So what it is, it's a box, a shoe box, actually, that you can make at home. And you take it, and usually you have an opening in here. And that opening, you have to cover it with the, with the, uh, the paper, for example, you take, you take paper in here. 
you tape it and you put it around so that you cover it in there just to barely see and you make a hole in here okay small hole and then you have an object in here like for example a candle and you will see the image forming in the back of here that is going to be upside down okay so this is in a nutshell how cameras work okay how focused this one is depending on the size of the object and how far the, uh, the uh, depending on the size of the hole and depending on also how far the object is from your camera. So this is a pinhole camera that uh, I know we used to do it when we were young, actually in the, uh, I think the, uh, the high school is those who took uh, 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 optics, they did that too, okay? So this is not hard to make. But the point being in here, this is the principle of how the cameras work also. This is this is the same thing. So this is how a camera actually does. It has a lens and it has actually a place where you have the film in the old days also. And you have a shutter in here that, that is basically closing the, uh, the, uh, uh, the film because the film, if it's exposed, is going to be ruined. So you would want it to be just exposed enough to capture the uh, the image in here. So again, when you click on it, you open the uh, the uh, the shutter so that the light will go through the lens. Again, it's going to produce an image that is upside down in this case. Okay, and you take the film and you develop it later on. And this is for a normal object. For some objects, for example, you need to set your uh, your timer in here. How long does it uh, needs to stay open? Okay, the, this is called the exposure time. Okay, in order to collect enough light, for example, if you take a picture outside in the dark night, you don't have enough, enough lighting, so you really want to have the exposure open long enough to collect enough light so that you have a sharp image. Otherwise, you open it sh short and you're not going to get much image. If you leave the exposure long during daytime, the film tend to be burned. Okay, and at the end, you will not have a, uh, so this is an overexposure, okay? The film can be overexposed or underexposed. And this is again, more of an art than, than science, honestly, because you have to really know what you're doing and the lighting conditions of the, your surrounding. This is for the, even this is true also for your, uh, for your regular uh, CCD camera, for your camera, the, the ones that use uh, electronic cameras. I mean, the modern cameras, not the film uh, ones. So they use also the same thing and they rely on how much the exposure is to see how much it's going to hit that sensitive screen in there so that to read and basically the pixels on, on it so that they can go and record the electronic image so that you can download a JPEG or PNG depending on what your camera works with, okay? So again, this is the basic technology for the camera. For the cases of lenses, and I know uh, we didn't have time to go through it, is that uh, you could combine lenses actually to either increase the magnification or redirect it in a specific direction, okay? So this is basically where you're, uh, what you can do. Here's what happened, okay? Every lens, every optical device has a, has a, has a power. And the power is equal to the inverse of the focal length. So this is how much it is. So for a 10 centimeter lens, this is one over 10 centimeters or 0 0.1. And the unit for it is known as a diopter. Okay, so this is the unit used for it. So if I combine two of them, so if I have two lenses, all I have to do is just add the two focal lengths. So if there is one device, this is a second one. So the power of the two com combination or combined power in this case is going to be simply equal to one over the first focal length plus one over the second focal length. Now this is true no matter what, okay? The reason why I'm saying that is because sometimes for diverging lenses, this number is negative. So if this one, for example, uh, uh, positive, this one is negative, the combination of the two is going to be the algebraic sum. And that's basically in a nutshell what it is. In other words, if one of them magnifies by a factor, for example, uh, 10, the other one shrinks it by a factor of 110, at the end, you're going to cancel everything. 
Okay, so this is basically some of the uh, effects that you can do. And the magnification is actually, as a matter of fact, is the product of the two. Okay, the product of the two. So this is some of the basics from these two chapters that you guys should have, we would have covered in here. So I'm hoping that you guys have full understanding of this ones in here. I'm picking up the book because uh, we still have a few minutes to go through the uh, problems that I have assigned. So let me stop sharing. Let me share with you guys. Let me find, first of all find the stuff in here. This one. No, it's actually another, another uh, this one. So let me share. Close the share again and share. Now it's ready. So again, you see these homework problems, 61, 63, 70, and 73 from page 374, that's chapter 17. And this also four problems from uh, chapter uh, 18, okay? So again, you're not going to, uh, we're not gonna be grading this one, but I'm expecting you guys to do them because come test time, you will have two versions of the exam, version where you'll have problems to do. And then there is a version where you actually, uh, uh, it's a multiple choice. So we have two things, kinds of exams for this class, okay? So again, let me get into page 374. to see what these problems are. So I'm looking at page 374 in here, and problem 61 is an easy problem. So it says a four centimeter diameter ball is located 40 centimeters uh, uh, from a point source and 80 centimeters from a wall. What is the size of the shadow on the wall? So, uh, Put my uh... so this is the the shadow here. Oops, I have to find where the problem is. I'm going to share with you guys a. Uh... So uh, here is the idea behind it, okay? Where's the email notes in here? Let me stop sharing that screen. Share. Okay. So here is the idea behind this point in here, okay? So what you have in here, you have an object, they gave you its size, okay? How much is it? Four centimeters, okay? This size is four centimeters. That's the diameter of the object, it's four centimeters. And you have a light source in here, and the light source is sitting at 40 centimeters. Okay? And this object is sitting at 80 centimeters from the wall. This distance is 80 centimeters. So the light is going to hit it, here and is going to produce a shadow on the wall. So what we're asked in here is how big the shadow is compared to how big the object is because how big the uh, the uh, the shadow is. Here is the idea behind it. If you use the ratios, the triangle ratios in here, okay. The ratio of the shadow over the ratio of the size of the object is actually that ratio is the tangent or a twist twice the, uh, the tangent of this angle, okay? Let's trick stuff. So if you take a triangle, this is what we're looking at. So this is the tangent of the angle. So if you take this size divided by this distance, that is the opposite over the adjacent. It's the same thing as this opposite over this adjacent. Okay, so it's the same ratio actually. So what I'm saying in here, the shadow over the size is the same ratio of this distance over the other distance. So this distance is actually 40 centimeters. 
and this whole distance is actually 120 centimeters. Because remember, 80 plus 40, because this is the where the, the object is. So this distance from the light source to the wall is 120 centimeters. 120 centimeters. Okay. So the shadow, which is this one, over 120 centimeters. So it's going to be the distance, which is 120 centimeters over the distance of the object to the light, which is 40 centimeters. Since we know the size of the object, so the shadow then will be the size of the object. All I have to do is multiply by the size of the object on both sides. So that cancels this size, and I'm really left with the other size. 120 divided by 40, that's three actually. So the shadow would be three times the size of the object. And the size of the object is given to us to be four centimeters. So how big the shadow is, three times four is going to be 12 centimeters. So that's in a nutshell. It's just simple geometry. In this case, you have, in the, you have to have in order to understand. And the geometry in here, you really don't need trig functions, OK? You really don't need the trig functions at all. I mean, I know I mentioned the sine on all of the tangent, all of that nonsense stuff, but you really don't need it. So if you look at this right angle triangle, and this right angle triangle, so two right angle triangles, those are similar triangles. Why? Because they share this angle between them, OK? And they are both 90 degree angles. Okay, this is also 90 degree angle. So this triangle and the other triangle are both similar. So what you say in this case is the ratio of the corresponding sizes sides are uh, equal. So this side over this side, which is half the shadow over half the object, or the full shadow, if you like, over the full size of the object, is the same ratio of this distance which is 120 centimeters over this distance, which is given to be 40 centimeters. And that's the end of it because of the similarity of the two triangles. So you don't need actually the, the sine or the tangent or the trig functions at all because they're not needed. It's the ratio of how big the shadow is versus how big the object is. And that ratio is the same ratio as how far the shadow is from the light source versus how far is the uh, object is from the light source. So this is the source. This is the object. And this is a shadow. OK, hopefully it makes sense to you guys. If you have any questions about it, please let me know. OK, the second one in here, again, I'm not going to be uh, sharing the other screen because I assume you guys have access to this homework problem. This is problem 63 from the book on the same page. So. 63, it says, use a ruler and a protractor to verify that the image produced by a flat mirror is far behind the mirror as the object is in front. So here we're going to do construction. And I am emphasizing on the construction to be an important aspect of doing this stuff. So you're going to take a ruler and protractor and do that and show me that the image forms in there. So what I'm going to do instead is the following. Let me stop sharing the screen. I have a GeoGebra account, and GeoGebra is actually a free software that you guys can use, OK? I actually can download it on my computer, but I'm, I don't have it on this specific computer. I have it on, on other computers. But you can use the online version. And actually, this is my account on the online version in here. You can see my picture. <laughs> so this is my online. My, my, and you can use it for whatever you like. I mean, this is a very powerful uh, stuff. So the website is geogebra.org if you're interested, trying to make it. But again, the homework is asking you to do it by construction. OK? So uh, again, in the, the types of stuff that you can do, you can do calculator, graphing, geometry, and things like that. So I picked geometry because we're doing geometry in this case. So let me go back to the move tool and let me center the screen in here. And I'm going to make an image of an object in front of a flat mirror and show by construction that the image forms at the same distance from the mirror as it does from the, uh, as the object is from the mirror, but on the other side, that's all. So what I'm going to do in here is construct first of all. So I took a segment. I'm going to put my mirror at a distance. Let me zoom out a little bit. Let me put the image, I mean, the mirror starting from the point 
five negative two. So I'm gonna put, this is the starting point of the image to negative 5.2. So it's kind of nice, neatly symmetrical image. So it's just a line. So if I'm doing it by hand, I'm gonna draw a straight line. Okay, that represents my, uh, uh, my mirror, okay? I'm gonna place an object in here. So I'm gonna draw a point in here. At that object, I'm gonna place it at a distance one, two, three, four, five units from the mirror. So this is my object. So C represents my object that I'm going to draw its image. Well, if I am careful enough, the ray that is going to come from C will hit the mirror in here and will bounce back off of uh, D and go back. So that's one of the, remember there are light every which way. This is one of the rays that is going to bounce off of the mirror. It appears as if it's coming from the other side of the mirror. And I'm going to see how that is done. The other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take another point in here on the mirror. It doesn't matter which, okay? I'm going to take a random point. So I'm going to take this point in here and draw the ray that is going to come from the object and hit the mirror somewhere in here. So I'm going to put this one in here. Now, if it does, the law of in, uh, reflection and refraction holds. And the same thing is true for the ray that is going to hit uh, uh, the mirror at the point D, it's going to reflect back on C. In other words, I'm going to draw a ray in here. Where is my uh, ray? I'm going to draw a ray starting from D and going back, passing through C. So that is the reflected ray. The reflected ray that hits D is going to reflect back on the same line. The reflected ray that is going to hit E is going to come out at the same angle as the, uh, as the one that came in. So the one that came in from CE will be reflected somewhere in here in such a way that the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. So let me find that angle. Oops, I didn't mean to do that, control Z. Okay, so let me find that angle first, okay? What is the angle? Here's the angle. I need to know the angle from C to E to the normal to the mirror, which is this side. And it's telling me that angle is 31 degrees, okay? So I just took a point in here. So what I really need is an over 31 degrees that corresponds to the same uh, angle of reflection. And then I'm going to draw my line. So this is what I would do with the protractor. I would have to find this angle and then measure another equal angle and draw it. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm going to draw another angle that starts from the same point, go through the same point E. And then I have to be careful in here in such a way that it is, one, two, three, one, two, three. Is it this point in here? Yep, 31 degrees, okay? So from E to G, I know that's 31 degrees. So again, I'm gonna draw a ray now, ray, ray. That is going to start at E and passes through G. So this is my reflected ray. The angle of incidence, 31 degrees, is equal to the angle of reflection, through, uh, 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 Then I'm having difficulty with this camera, okay? Sorry about this, okay? Can you hear me still, TJ? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, very good, thank you. So let's finish this one in here. So let me go back into the construction of the image. Share. Again, what I did so far is that I have an incoming ray from the object which sitting at C, hits the mirror at point D and reflects back on C. 
And also it hits it at the point E. I know the angle, I was able to find the angle to be 31 degrees. And then I found another angle 31 degrees that is going to be my reflected ray. It appears to me from a perfectly reflecting mirror that the ray that is coming from E is actually going to go back. It's coming from infinity. So I'm going to draw a ray now going from G back to as if it's coming from the back of the uh, of the uh, going through E itself. So this is my ray as if it's coming from the other side of the screen. The same thing, the one that is coming from C, C hitting D as if it's coming from the other side of the screen. The intersection of these two is actually where uh, the uh, the image is actually coming from. So this is where the image is coming from. Now by construction, no math involved. The only math involved is this degrees in here to make sure that we have. We need to find where the image is. The image appears to be <coughs> coming from this point, point H, where the intersection of these two lines are. So this point in here has a dark color in here because it's actually an uh, intersection and unlike the other two blue ones, the blue ones that were actually by, uh, I made them up. We made them up when we intercepted these things. Now, let's find out how far it is. It's one, two, three, four. Basically, the fifth one is in there. So you start from the mirror, you count. One, two, three, four, five. You start from the mirror again to find where the object is. One, two, three, four, five. You use your ruler and you measure the distances and they are identical. So that answers question number three. Uh, 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 question 63, I guess, okay? Use a ruler and make the construction. So instead I use GeoGebra because I don't, I mean, it's actually easier for me to do it this way. Otherwise you can do it with a ruler too. It's identical, construction is the same, okay? Uh, let me talk briefly about the other two in here. Let me stop sharing in here and let's go back into where we were. This in the screen, where is the... Seventy and seventy-three. Seventy and seventy-three. Seventy. It says a telescope mirror is part of a sphere with a radius of three meters. What is the focal length? What you guys need to know in here is, and we didn't do that. The theory behind it is that the focal length is half the radius. And the reason why I brought this one up is very important because if you think of the the lenses, for example, of the James Webb or the lenses for the uh, Hubble telescope and all of that, usually you're given the diameter, which can divide by two and find the radius. Once you find the radius, you still have to divide that by factor of two to find uh, the focal length. For this case, the focal length is 1.5 meters. That is how far it is. So the rays come from infinity. So if you're going to play, if you have an antenna, for example, on your roof, and you would want to find the focal length in order to put your uh, LMB device so that it collects all the rays so that it goes to your TV. So in order to find that where the LMB is, you have to really put it on the focal. So the rays come from infinity and they hit the antenna, you want them all to come back to the focal point. So in this case, the focal point is going to be exactly at the distance of 1.5 meters. So that is basically uh, that problem 70, 70. And then the other one is, 73. 73 actually requires an, a six centimeter tall object is placed 60 centimeters from a concave mirror with a focal length of 20 centimeters. Draw a ray diagram to find the location of the image. Again, let me share uh, GeoGebra so that you guys see. Again, you'll need a ruler, a protractor, and all of that, and you're going to find the, the, where the location is. So share. If you are, if you are proficient with GeoGebra, you can use GeoGebra, okay? Where is my GeoGebra? Okay, let me first of all put it in here, okay? So let me go back, share GeoGebra. Okay, so let me first of all uh, uh, select all, where is select all, and delete everything. Okay, so I'm gonna move this thing a little bit to this side in here because we're going to place a mirror in here, okay? And the mirror, uh, because again, the, the, the focal length is half the, uh, the, uh, the uh, radius. So I'm gonna take advantage of that. So we're immediately following up the three previous problems. So we're gonna make a mirror that has a focal length 
and they said 20 centimeters. So I'm going to assume that this is 10 centimeters, 20 centimeters, and so on and so forth. So two is actually on my scale is 20 centimeters. Okay. So I need to make a, a mirror of, 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 of a radius four centimeters so that the focal length is two centimeters on this scale. Okay. So I need to come in here and by construction, get a semicircle. Semicircle is going to be of radius four centimeters because this is what I want my mirror to be. And I want its focal length to be two centimeters. So I'm gonna start from the point negative four and four and go all the way to positive four and four. So this is basically my mirror, provided even in the construction of the big dishes on your antennas and everything else, they take a big sphere and they cut it and they cut it in such a way that they cut it only here. So this is really where I want to have the mirror. So it's not from A to B. My mirror is going to be probably from this position one to position negative one. Otherwise, uh, it's not good enough. It's, it really has to be parabolic. This is not parabolic, this is spherical. Because I made a sphere basically, and I'm going to cut from it as many antennas as I need. So in this situation, this is where my, uh, my, uh, my, uh, my mirror is. For that, I'm going to zoom in. Oops, control Z, I don't want to make another one. Okay, where is my selection tool? The move tool. So again, so here is my antenna and how it looks like, okay? My object, they said it's sitting at six centimeters from 60 centimeters. So on my scale, if this is the focal length of the mirror, is 20 centimeters, my object is sitting in here at six centimeters from the problem, 60 centimeters. And my object, they said, needs to be about uh, six centimeters in high, in height. So six centimeters compared to where far it is, it's very small, it's a small object. So I'm gonna take an object in here again, I'm gonna take a segment at a distance six, and I'm gonna draw an object of this height, okay? Remember the focal plan, the focus of this length of this uh, mirror by design is two centimeters. Okay, it's 20 centimeters on the scale, it's two. So I'm gonna take a ray now and I'm gonna draw, the, draw it from this here that is parallel to the axis of symmetry and hits the mirror somewhere in there where, it's, where it meets it. And then the reflected one is going to pass through the, uh, the uh, so the reflected ray is going to pass through the focal length. So I know the image is somewhere in here. And this one. Okay, I need to find the exact image. So another point in here that I could draw is another segment in here, starting from D and going to the axis of the lens, okay, point G. But then that one is going to be reflected in such a way that the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. So this is my ray. And in such a way, it passes by a point identical to this point. So where is my image now? Is where these two lines meet the one that passes through the focal point and the one that comes in through the uh, axis of symmetry. In other words, the angle of incidence in here is equal to the angle of reflection in here. And so is this one, the angle of incidence and the angle of reflection, the normal is in here, that's the tangent in here. So if you're doing it at home and you're going to do it, this is part of your assignment, okay? Make sure you have a protractor, you have a ruler and you can find the tangent which touches the point E in here and find the normal to that and then draw the perpendicular to it or make it run through the focal point. The way I constructed my mirror in here is how actually commercial construction of mirrors they do. They take a big sphere and they start cutting it depending on how much they want their focal points. That is not how the Hubble telescope was made though. That is not how uh, uh, the uh, James Webb was made because those they are professionals. They don't like this. Uh, they're actually they're scientific. They don't like this. Uh, business of commercial uses for these things. They want them to be parabolic. So they really take a long time to make that perfect antenna, okay? So in this case, this is just a commercial basically construction of a mirror. 
So now I have my image. The image is sitting at three in here. So I can actually find the image by drawing another point from the base, which is the axis of symmetry of the mirror, up to where these two points meet. Okay. Actually, the, the starting point is kind of off a little. It needs to be according to my construction of, yeah, that's, that's as best as I can. Okay, so let me zoom on this thing in here. Am I getting it correct? Or did I move the, uh, the points in here? Anyway, my construction is off a little. And again, because it has errors and it's probably I'm not exactly where I need to be. Maybe this line is not passing through that. So I have an error in here. So my line is not sitting on one or the other two lines, somewhere in between. It's not exactly three. It's 2.91, 92, 93. It's 2.98 and a half. It's almost 2.99, okay? That's basically my construction here. And that's good enough because if I do the math, let me show you the math for this problem. Let me share my notes in here. Okay, so again, the formula that we're using, are you guys looking at uh, OneNote? Yes, yes. Okay, so the math in this case, one over the object, the object is 60 centimeters, by the way, plus one over image is equal to one over 20 centimeters, okay? The focal length for this problem is 20 centimeters. So, uh, uh, in this case, one over image is equal one over 20 minus one over 60. The common denominator is 60. This has to be multiplied by three to get it to 60. And this is, stays the same. So three minus two, two is actually two over 60. Two over 60. And uh, I mean, you can do it by calculator if you really are not uh, too, too uh, practiced in this thing. In that. 2 over 60, I can simplify by 2, and it's going to be 1 over 30. So the answer is the 1 over image is 1 over 30, meaning if I invert everything, the image is exactly at 30 centimeters. Obviously, my construction in here is not giving me 30 centimeters. It's giving me slightly off because I have some errors in it. Okay, Again, one of the off problems that I have, and I can tell you about it, is the mirror itself is not really, the focal length is not exactly 2 centimeters. It's not 20 centimeters, I should say, because remember, I scaled everything by a factor of 10 in here. Instead of 20 centimeters, I put it at 2. Instead of 60 centimeters, I put it at 6. And uh, the image came to be about three, uh, 3, which is 30 centimeters. So one of the problems I can tell you also is that the focal length, which is, seems to be sitting at 2, is not exactly 2, because my design in here, I designed it imperfect. I used a spherical mirror in here. OK. I think we ran out of time for this today. Uh, we still have problems from the next uh, you, from the next chapter, which I already posted for you guys. I would be more than happy to share the solutions with you guys, or probably do a special session or something. And this goes for those who are here right now. I know one of you guys just joined us, so you really need to watch the previous recording, uh, previous uh, basically because we we started early. So you watch that and you when you go through this ones in here. So again, there are more assigned assignments that you guys, I want you to be comfortable with and work through them and make sure that you understand on how to do them. And this concludes basically these two chapters. Sounds good? Yes, yes. Okay, very good. So I'm going to, uh, thank you, Madison. So I'm going to stop the recording and I will see you guys next week. And uh, make sure you uh, ask for uh, questions if you are if you don't understand how to do something. Again, there are all kinds of assignments. A lot of them are on construction. Some of them, and the formula that I used from time to time is just to check my uh, my construction. Part of the lab is also to do construction, but at least for one group, we did the uh, we did the formula to make sure also that we were not off. Okay, I'll see you guys next week.